Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, and we ask for your presence and your grace to be with us today. We ask you to anoint your word, open our eyes, open our ears, soften our hearts to receive whatever you would show us. We pray that waves of blessing would go forth to all your people around the world. Remind them of, their, of our love for them and of your love for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
what he can do with faith. Oh, what he can do. I'll say it again. Oh, there is no telling, no telling what God can do. What he can do. Oh, what he can do. Oh, and there is no telling, no telling what God can do. song came to me this morning, but I was thinking about, many people probably know, some don't, that my nephew was in a pretty bad car accident on Monday, very serious, rolled his car several times and was fl flung out of the vehicle. And the original prognosis was pretty bleak. It was, from those on the scene, they weren't sure he was going to make it to the hospital. And if he did, they felt like he'd probably suffer lifelong trauma, either physical or mental or both. And um, on the way over here, we got word that they were moving him out of the ICU today. And he, was, he had one small chip the size of a quarter of a chipped bone in his hip, no other broken bones, no other brain damage or anything. He, he seems like he's going to make a complete recovery, and it's nothing short of a miracle. And God has moved mountains. And so I came in here pretty happy and feeling a lot of uh, a reason to praise and I thought of this old song this morning Amen. One day old Elijah had some problems on the mountain all alone he stood against 400 prophets of Baal he said let the true God answer with fire upon the altar and when he prayed the fire came down you could hear Elijah yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm serving a God who 
who's able to deliver. I'm glad I'm serving a God who's able to defend. I'm glad I'm serving a God who hears me when I pray. I'm glad I'm serving a God on whom I can depend. And when this life is over and I'm standing in that city, gathered with the saints and the countless throng. You know someone might just ask me, why are you so happy? Just like Elijah, I will sing that same song. No, I'm glad I'm serving a God who's able to deliver. Oh, I'm glad I'm serving a God That did make me think of reason to praise. Can we sing that as well? Amen. Jesus. When Gabe first called me, when you called me there from the scene of the accident, you, you seemed pretty hopeless. They, uh, Tom was the first EMT at the scene, and he told the sheriff he didn't know if the ambulance would make it. Amen. Yeah. God is merciful. Things have been improving ever since that moment. Amen. So. Thank you, Jesus. I'm at my head, you're just getting started. When I hit a wall, you just walk through it. When I face a mountain, you are the maker. So it's got to move. When I'm out of faith, you are still faithful when I'm at my worst and you are still good and all of my questions you are the answer it all points to you cause you're the God of the breakthrough when I'm breaking down you'll be Working a way through when there's no way out. This one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So, whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason to Out of our wrongs, you write our story, and out of the cross comes rivers of grace, and out of
seeming inevitable course of death we know it we know it's a miracle amen. amen well let's shift now to questions and discussion and uh, again if you want to send something in send it text it to 661-212-5415 or post it in the comment section below the YouTube video and we will do our best to answer if the question comes in while we're still online and uh, Kevin is going to start fielding those questions to us. I haven't seen any of the ones that have come in today. So um, all of them are going to be a blind, uh, blind site. So send them in as you can. And if you send them in quick, we'll answer while we're still here. Amen. Good to have you back from Wisconsin. Amen. It's good to be back. Did you pick up a Wisconsin accent? I did not. So you still <laughs> say house and not house? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, I did. I was feeling something when... Brother Gabe, you were sharing about your nephew. Um, you know, we got a text message, as did the rest of the church. And we were in the middle of a, a meeting with maybe 30, 40 people in it. Up in Wisconsin? And up in Wisconsin, yes, sir. And so, um, you know, we, we read the text message out loud. And we didn't even have to talk about praying. or I mean, we just erupted into prayer the whole room, you know. And what struck me is that, um, and what I was thinking about just now, is just that, you know, I used to think of prayer as just, you know, giving some things to God and just, you know, we'll see what happens. Mm. But we felt a response. Mm. You know, it's like the whole room prayed with our whole hearts. I mean, we erupted into prayer mm. and you felt a peace. Amen. And we felt a peace. And I just, I think of situations like that and I think the initial response can be worry and mm. fear and just, uh, and, you know, and it, isn't it wonderful that we have a father Amen. that not only we can, we can lift our requests up to him with thanksgiving, Amen. but we can actually feel what he's, um, his heart Amen. on the matter Amen. immediately, Amen. you know, so Amen. I just, I just was so thankful for that. You, and, and then we got another text. I, I don't remember how long later it was. Uh, the first text communicated urgency and seriousness. Yes. Um, and the next text was, you know, it looks like things are, are turning up. Amen. And again, we just erupted into prayer all over again. <laughs> and you felt, you just felt so, you feel the presence of God. Amen. And I'm Amen. just thankful for the fact that we can do that Amen. as a people. And I'm sure that was happening all around the, yes. the country and the world even, yes. you know, yes, as sir. we share these messages with one another and, yes, and pray. Amen. So, Amen. And the last situation like that, was Sister Destiny. Amen. <laughs> and look what God did. Amen. You know? Amen. It'd be a privilege to know of one miracle like that in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, well, let's All get right. into it. Well, the first question is pretty straightforward. Was it just unbelief that caused the disciples who walked with Jesus to deny him? Hmm. That's a, that requires a little bit of speculation. <laughs> Um, are we referring to when Jesus predicts and tells Peter, um, you will deny me before men? I would think so. Yeah, I, I would That's think so. To, yeah. And then when Peter denies him before in, in the courtyard of Caiaphas. No, I, I think that 
you know, it's how we categorize belief. You know, when, when the Lord tells Peter that, Peter says, Lord, I will not deny you. I will go with you even to prison and to death. And if belief is simply a total persuasion in the facts of who Jesus is, Peter had it in spades. He had it better than any of us have it. But there's this interesting phrase that Peter actually uses in Acts 11. And he tells the disciples that Cornelius received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues just as we did when we first believed. Amen. And there's this suggestion in that statement that while they had walked with Christ for three and a half years and believed in Him as is uh, repeatedly proven in the text, for those three and a half years there was some major turning point that came on the day of Pentecost. And I think that we have always drawn a great contrast between the Peter who has the good intentions but lacks the power to fulfill those intentions and is cowering before a servant girl in the courtyard of Caiaphas versus the Peter who is arguably facing much more scary odds on the day of Pentecost when all of Jerusalem is gathered and the Sanhedrin is empowered by their recent crucifixion of Christ and this time he stands lacking all the fear and possessing all the courage he formerly lacked and he begins to proclaim the gospel. And the difference is that Jesus says, tarry in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. So Peter had a relationship with Jesus before Pentecost. He even had the Spirit use him for healing, perhaps resurrection, we don't know, but casting out demons, we know, from the sending out of the 70. Peter was a mighty man, but he did not have the power over the fear of death. He did not have the power over the most ardent instinct in human nature, which is self-preservation, until Pentecost. Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be clothed with power from on high. And again in Acts, he says, after that the Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. And that power is, is what Peter lacked when he was in Caiaphas' courtyard, and it's what he had shortly after, on the day of Pentecost, shortly after the outpouring of the Spirit. Amen. And so this is a fulfillment of what Jesus says in John when he says about the Holy Spirit, you know him for he has been with you, but he will be in you. Amen. So that which was in proximity to Peter, that which was near Peter, came inside of Peter at Pentecost. And it just helped him overcome all of that, all of that self-preservation and anxiety that was really leading him against his better intentions. I would say it's more than just simple unbelief. I would say they lack the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, would you say, just for clarity's sake, if there was some unbelief in Peter before Pentecost, or maybe not the level of belief or faith that he had after Pentecost, would you have called him a believer? Absolutely. Before Pentecost? Absolutely. No, th there's no doubt about it. <laughs> he was a believer, just like those in John 8 were believers. It says, Jesus said to those Jews who were believing in him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So belief is not a punctiliar thing. It's not this moment in time where we claim an, a permanent status. Belief is the, the entrance ramp onto a highway of holiness that we've got to keep walking. Amen. And we've got to keep going unless we exit again. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, so yes, he had belief. But it, it, the, I believe the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced there in, 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 on the day of Pentecost, I believe that does mark a degree of faith. Amen? Amen? So you can have a certain amount of faith, but that marks a, a greater degree and the ultimate degree that God is aiming for with all of us. So in a sense, he was a believer prior to that, and yet he also saw Pentecost as a seminal adjustment in the extent of his faith, else he wouldn't have said, just as we received it when we first believed Amen. in Acts 11. Amen? Amen? So he was a believer, but he was an uber-believer <laughs> at Pentecost. <laughs> and I don't mean in 
Uber isn't a proper noun there. <laughs> Would you add anything to that? I'm just thinking that, you know, I'm wondering what the <clears throat> motivation of the question is, and, and that may be a speculation, but it seems like maybe we want to know the answer to that question because there's something troubling about this exchange with Peter where he, he says all the right things. He has all the right plans. He seems completely sincere in his intentions right before he fails and does the very thing that Jesus said he would do and Peter said he would not do. Jesus pressed him on it and he still insisted that's not going to happen. And so I think it's troubling to us to think, well, ha could that happen to me? If it happened to Peter, could it happen to me? What is the dynamic that would cause Peter to do something like that? Um, so soon after he had such a clear uh, profession. And um, I guess I, in, in terms of faith and belief, it seems like there were some conflicting faiths, we might say. While Peter does in fact feel a loyalty towards Jesus, there is also a self-confidence in the way that he contradicts the Lord's words to him with his own assessment of his own readiness and preparedness and so forth. So there's a self-confidence mm -hmm. that is the precursor to this yielding to self-preservation um, because really there's, there's a faith and a belief in himself. There's a trust in himself that Amen. is obviously still at work. Amen. And we can contrast that to what has happened after his failure, after the courtyard where he looks up after the, the roosters crowed and he, he sees across, he, Jesus looks at him across the, the way and, and uh, it just takes a look and he goes outside and he weeps bitterly. And um, it's hard to even imagine what those following days must have felt like to Peter. Not just we've lost Jesus, but what a note to go out on. Yeah. You know, everything I, th I said I would do, I, I didn't do. Yeah. And then when Jesus, when Peter first sees him again, it's on the shore yeah. there in the end of John. And, um, you know, he, He's excited to see him. He jumps out of the boat. He's going to go go see him, but but he, uh, you know, when he gets there, you know, no one no one asked. It says no one asked him who he was because they all knew it was the Lord. And he's making breakfast. And and uh, anyway, that whole exchange happens, and where Jesus presses Peter, do you have agape? Do you have the kind of love that would lay down your life, not just phileo, the kind of love that is an affection, that is. Uh, uh, brotherly kindness it could be translated or it can be deep feelings even um, but it's not the kind of love that is sufficient to cause one to lay down their life and Peter's gotten honest in the time that's passed since since that night in the garden when he was so sure of himself his failures have humbled him and made him honest and when Jesus presses the point to the to where Peter has to to say Lord you know all things you know that I have phileo for you, not agape is the implication. It just seems like he's reckoned with something. Some kind of repentance has been at work in his heart where he's now able to say, Lord, <laughs> I'm not making claims about myself. Amen. You know all things. Amen. And you know that what I've proved is that I've only got a certain level of love for you. Amen. you know? But Jesus leaves him with a promise. He tells him, he says, um, when you were young, you went where you wanted to go. You walked about under your own power, it can be translated. But when you're older, another is going to pick you up, gird you up and carry you in a way that you would not go. And it said that he said this to indicate the death by which Peter would glorify God. And we, we, you know, legend tells us that Peter was crucified, crucified upside down at his own request and all that. We don't know if all that's exactly true. We do know he was martyred. But I've always thought that it, it seems like he's saying more than just his final physical death. Yeah. It seems like he's also telling him there is a death to yourself. Amen. There's a death to your self-confidence, to your pride that is coming. And this is going to pick you up. You're going to have a power that you did not have. You tried to do it with your own strength. You got out your sword and all you could do was trim somebody's ear. <laughs> but there's going to be another kind of power that is going to take you in a way that not only did you not want to go, you couldn't go Amen. in your flesh. Peter's nervous about it. He's, you know, it's what about him and all of that. But at the same time, you have to wonder if there wasn't 
something stirring in Peter's heart that would leap at the idea that you mean there's a power beyond me that can help me transcend the failures that I've just exhibited to myself and to everybody else. It was good news, Amen. I think. Whether he saw it completely at the time or not, I think it was I think it was good news. Amen. So was it just unbelief? <laughs> no. <laughs> it was also belief. Yeah. Belief in oneself and one's capacity. I know my intentions. I know I'm going to do the right thing. I know what I want to do. And uh, it's just not all there is to it. There's got to be a humility inside of us that, that places all of our trust, all of our hope in Jesus. Amen. When he says he's got doubts about us, let's listen up. <laughs> you know, what, what would have happened? What could have happened if Peter had said, Lord, why are you saying that? You know, I want to see it. Is there something in me? Help me understand, you know. He doesn't seem to do that. He just digs in his heels and asserts his own intentions yeah. and then falls on his face. Yeah. I think we alluded last week to the fact that the writer of Hebrews conjoins repentance from dead works and faith toward God and how those are two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. and how true repentance is always accompanied by the collapse of faith in the flesh and this unflagging confidence in God. And I think that's, that's what you're describing. That's really what happened. And, and I think if, if I have my chronology right, when he tells him that he's going to deny him, yes, this is right, when he tells him he's going to deny him and Peter is still protesting, he says, but when you are converted mm -hmm. again, when you, are, when you have turned again, mm -hmm. you will strengthen your brothers. And he was, he was saying, you're going to go through something. You're going to discover a, a, a degree in yourself that is not converted, a degree in yourself that, has, that is not really turned toward God. But when it has turned back, you're going to be the power and strength to your brothers. So his very failures were going to become the occasion for him offering grace to his brothers. And we see that on the day of Pentecost and really throughout. So Jesus, Jesus just had a proper, had an accurate evaluation of this guy. Yeah. I think that if, if Peter had been able to rely, I've said before, if Peter had been able to, to show his loyalty with the arm of the flesh, he would have fought in the garden till the bloody end. Mm -hmm. If Jesus had looked over at him and winked instead of said, instead of told him to put his sword in his place, I mean, it would have been an all out battle, but it was, he, he, he had a lot of confidence in moving in the flesh, just not very much in trusting God and moving in the spirit. I think it's the same context also where he says, Satan has asked for you. Yes, it is. To sift you like wheat. Yeah. But I have prayed for you. Yeah. That your faith may not fail you. Yeah. And in a sense, we could say that, that his, his faith failed. Really, it more seems like his confidence in himself and his self-preservation, his desire to preserve his own life there in the courtyard, right. um, kick in and override his faith. Right. You know, yeah. and so in a sense, his, his deepest faith didn't fail yet. Right. You know, he still, there was still something in him that was ready to jump out of the boat and run yeah. back to the feet of the Lord and, and yeah. get back up. You yeah. know, in an ultimate sense, his faith did not fail. Amen. But he entered into temptation, which he is did. what he's praying in the garden. He tells them three times, pray, lest you enter into mm -hmm. the temptation. Now, Jesus said Satan because is Because yes. the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen. Yeah. And this is the fulfillment of what he had predicted in Luke when he says, Satan has asked for this, but I have prayed for you. Then he tells them, pray, lest you enter into temptation. And we know that that's what Jesus was doing. He was praying with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save his soul from death. He was begging God to spare him and yet asking God, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And as a result, he was receiving what the Bible calls strengthening. Jesus was receiving strengthening through that prayer. Mm -hmm. Peter and the others were so upset by the situation that they were unable to engage and prepare and they're sleeping. And so they do enter into temptation. <laughs> and the temptation that he entered into was that utter collapse of faith resorting to the arm of the flesh, and ultimately the betrayal that caused him to weep, as you described. Yep. One of the most poignant stories in the whole Bible, the story of Peter. He gives us hope for ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> you draw a lot of faith from it, really, that Amen. 
Jesus is so patient with him. Amen. He, he, Jesus seems to have picked people that Amen. were zealots. Amen. You know, he, he doesn't, he likes people that are, that are going to do it. Amen. You know, as long as they're willing to be corrected. Amen. And Peter was. Amen. Amen. Wow. That's, um, I couldn't help but think of my own journey when y'all were talking and coming to know God in 2006 and in such a radical way, life-changing way, and so zealous for God I would do anything, you know, and, and then it wasn't long before I professed Him. I professed to know Him, but by my, by my works denied Him, yes. you know, and 11 years later came repentance because I realized I couldn't do it on my own anymore and I was tired and, and I remember telling God at that time, I'll never do that again. I'll never go back. I'm going all the way this time. I will never go back to that place, you know. And, and a couple years later, you know, Brother Zach's up in Idaho and I'm still in California and I start to feel weak again. And I start to feel like, I, I don't know if I can do this, you know. And so we take off by faith and just go on this journey and, and then we learn of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, and everything changed. Amen. Amen. We, um, amen. It gave, it, it, I mean, y'all, y'all were there. Y'all know the story, but it's such a different place to just have, be filled with the spirit of the amen. living God amen. and be framed within a body. Amen. There's power that I, there's just, it, there's no comparison. Amen. amen. I know that if I would have stayed in California and tried to do it in my own strength, like Peter, amen. I would have fallen again. Amen. And I started to feel that happening. Yes, and praise God, He showed us the way. Amen. You know, and He gave us the answer. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, Amen. I just, I couldn't help but think of that as y'all were talking. I'm like, wait a minute. That sounds a lot like. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, um, Jesus. Next question. Who is Charles H. Spurgeon? <laughs> His doctrines and theology seem to be very influential. and He is very highly regarded in evangelical circles. Thank you for taking the time to answer this question get a shorter answer on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Charles Spurgeon was, uh, was a preacher, a revivalist of a certain type, um, who really believed in the supremacy of God's Word, and um, he was mightily used of God to, to exalt the holiness of God, to exalt the grace of God, you know, I don't, I celebrate the, the extent of the anointing and the grace that, that, that God used, that, that God extended through his life and through his ministry. And like uh, Jonathan Edwards or others of that similar era, he was, um, he was mightily used. He was, and yet I wouldn't say that the fact that here is a man who within his framework is doing the best he can to honor God and proclaiming God's word and expanding the influence of scripture and, and even the conviction of truth on many hearts. That fact does not mean that everything he stood for and every, everything about the context he was in is somehow sanctioned by God. He was, he was a... Um, he was a predestinationalist Calvinist, and I, I, find, I find that to be an odious perversion of Scripture and the grace of God. So while I can celebrate and rejoice in, in so many insights and so much anointed truth that came forth from him, and I, I truly celebrate him as a man of God along the journey, as far as I'm aware, um, that doesn't mean that I have to wholesale accept everything he believed in. We are on a journey, and that journey is a journey of restoration. And I don't judge those in the past who moved us in the right direction. Amen. I judge them for the direction they took toward restoration, not whatever was still left behind in their journey. And, and so, yeah, I mean, look him up on Wikipedia, but don't accept everything. I would not recommend accepting his theology carte blanche just because he was such an effective, powerful preacher. And in fact, many today kind of idolize him and kind of turn him into this hero of, I don't know, it's almost like a cult following of, of Charles Spurgeon. And 
I don't know. I just, I don't think that that's really what the Lord is trying to do in this time. I don't think he's trying to raise up shooting stars. I think he's trying to raise up an expression of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I, I haven't always been enamored with some of the dynamics behind the Charles Spurgeon worship that I've encountered. Though I think that as far as I'm aware, God used him to spark repentance and a turn toward the Lord in many thousands of hearts. And for that, I'm grateful. Amen. Amen. Did you add anything to that? No, sir. Amen. Reflecting back on what Brother Ossie was sharing last week on the true fulfillment of the Sabbath, what does the homestead community do on Sundays? Is it a day of rest? Well, what I said is that the true Sabbath is a walk in the Spirit. Amen. Amen. And that is not a one day event, that's every day. And so what we try to do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, yes, Saturday and also Sunday is follow the leading of the Spirit. Amen. And and if we live a day that is represented by the gear grinding machinations of the fruitless flesh, we feel we have abandoned the Sabbath and we we seek to get back into alignment with God's grace, His body, His word, especially His spirit, so that we can abide in the Sabbath. Our general pattern for Sundays is that it is a day of rest and that we gather for worship at noon and, and then we spend time with family and we, we break bread together and we have, fellowship, we have worship and fellowship. Worship, the hearing of God's word, the exchange of God's word with one another, and then a relaxed day of taking walks and enjoying fellowship and good food and and just yeah it's it's generally a day of rest that doesn't mean that there aren't times where we will also feel to say you know what god has us god is anointing us to accomplish a task and so we're going to we're going to change our schedule around here because we don't esteem one day as more important than the other um, we esteem our walk with god as of importance and so there are times when we'll We'll rearrange things and, and, and make Sunday the work day and do, and do worship at some other time. So, but our general pattern, nine times out of ten, yes, Sunday is our day of rest, our day of worship, hearing the word of God, and spending time with family. Amen. Couldn't we say that there's really a sense in which some of the things in the Old Testament, the Sabbath included, have multiple purposes? You know, Amen. That, that there might have been a primary purpose, even in the Old Testament, that was for the cultivation of people's hearts right. in that type and shadow of what was to come. Yes. That God expected very clear adherence to certain externally uh, imposed and externally walked out actions or inaction, as the case may be on the Sabbath. Yes. Um, that they were they were to honor that, and that that aspect of it is fulfilled in yes. the New Testament in submission yes. to the Spirit. Yes. And yet there are also sometimes other aspects to things. I'm right. thinking of things like the, the dietary law, for right. example, that that has, um, there are a lot of health benefits. That's right. another topic, but right. we stick to the dietary law right. by and large, uh, other than the guidelines that we see in the New Testament that you eat what's set before you and not asking questions for conscience sake, when, you know, as, so right. as not to offend people and all that. And yet we, we generally adhere to the dietary law because guess what? It turns out that God knew something about people that science only confirmed millennia later that um, that it's um, it's not good for you to eat shellfish and pork and some of these kinds of things. But um, and yet, so there is another purpose that while you wouldn't we don't follow the dietary law legalistically uh, for, for righteousness', righteousness sake. Yeah. We still follow it because we feel like it's a, it's a good pattern for health. Amen. And I think even the seven-day week right. has a similar uh, type of feeling. Yeah, and absolutely. There's, there's a rhythm to it. Um, Y'all would have to, to check me on this and look this up, but I've been told that actually during the time, I believe it was Napoleon, he decided right. that a 10-day week would be more efficient. Right. We get more done if we stop having people take off every seven days. Let's have them take off every 10 days. Right. And it turned out that, it, as I understand it, it kind of threw the society into, into trouble. Yes. And they, they had like their draft animals were dying and things like that yes. because it, people just aren't really made to go, 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 go for nine days. It turns out a rhythm that works better is to work for six and to 
and to rest more on the seventh day. And yes. so I just think there are things like that too that we're flowing with, not to mention right. uh, cultural realities in the United States. And, and certainly our fellowship in Israel is even more the case and they would take a Sabbath on Saturday right. um, to being all things to all men to flow with that society that they're, they're in. Yes. And so there's just something to it is Absolutely. what I'm saying that I think it, in a general way we're adhering to it. It's just not that it's for righteousness sake. Right. You know. Absolutely. And we see the, the health benefits in it. We see that the Jewish community is, is blessed physically and naturally through that adherence. We're just not saying that we can any longer obey the scriptural mandate to Sabbath by doing the shadow. We have to do the substance, yes, which sir. is of the Spirit. And, and to your point, in our communities, we've even observed a, a Sabbath year rest mm -hmm. because we've acknowledged on the, land, yeah. on the land that we've acknowledged that the Sabbath is, is a benefit for us. It is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And so it is good for the land to rest the land. And we found creative ways to rest it. And each one is, is free to do what is right in his own heart in that regard. But generally speaking, on church owned land, we will rest it every seven years. And there were there was a, a good period in our church's history where we did worship on Saturday. And we don't have any aversion to worshiping on Saturday. Mm -hmm. It's just we're unwilling to deceive ourselves and imagine that that is a heightened obedience to the mm -hmm. command when the command is fulfilled in the walking of the Holy Spirit and the ceasing from our own works. But at the same time, to Brother Dan's point, we see health benefits and advantages in the natural realm that we, we don't want to miss out on either. And so, amen. Yeah, we, tend to, we typically follow that same pattern, even if we do it on Sunday instead of Saturday. Amen. <clears throat> Next question. I listened to Brother Ossie's message, The Final Temple. Do you believe that there will be a third temple, quote, material building built in Jerusalem during the tribulation? Or are most people deceived and don't realize that he is talking about the church the bride of Christ fitly framed as the third temple where God dwells? Well, if you listen to my message, you should know the answer to that question. Um, I don't suppose that it's impossible for man to, uh, apart from God's will, go construct a temple, a building, that is, in Jerusalem. But that is not the third temple, and that is not the temple that God has promised and predicted will mark the end times. I firmly believe that the body of Christ coming together as a fitly framed composition of, of God is the third temple. And when, when the body of Christ rises up from, you know, uh, I, I've often said that there's a difference between a pile of stones and a stone temple. And that is the order in which the stones are arranged according to a design. And Christianity has been so individualized that it is not composed at its heart's desire. It is in disarray. It is in decomposition. And I believe that the end time prophecy, uh, both of Ezekiel and otherwise, is pointing toward a relational temple. Again, the stone temple is a shadow. It is not the substance. Jesus showed no attachment, no infatuation with that stone temple. He told the woman at the well, he said, woman, believe me as if he were about to say something hard to believe. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will not worship either on this mountain or in Jerusalem, but they will worship in spirit and in truth for the Father is seeking such to worship him. So I believe that that stone temple and its entire purpose is completely fulfilled and it is now obsolete and it is it was to point toward it was to be a metaphor for the body of Christ and the body of Christ is the only fulfillment of the temple that Paul is speaking of in Ephesians 2 that that uh, Peter is speaking of in 1st Peter 2 that's the temple that's the place God I will they will be my people I will live in them and walk among them they will be my people and I will be their God. The tabernacle of God is now among men. So no, I do not believe, it doesn't mean that somebody can't build something. 
a lot of dumb buildings have been built and will always be built. So, yeah, somebody can build something on in Jerusalem or anywhere else and declare it the temple of God. <laughs> That's obsolete. That has no place in, in the economy of God's salvific plan for mankind. The temple is the body of Christ. Amen. The next question, <clears throat> Jude one nine speaks of Michael contending with the devil for the body of Moses. And Michael stated, and how Michael stated, the Lord rebuke the, it just has that in quotes. How does this verse fit with the rest of the book? What is the Lord wanting us to understand here? Well, what Jude is talking about is how people, it seems, in the church are rejecting God's authority. And he says that they are spots and blemishes in your love feast. They are hidden reefs. So when the sea looks smooth and the, and the, and the, so the ship is sailing in, beneath the surface is this craggy interruption of a hidden reef. And he's saying there are people in the church who are hidden problems that you don't realize. They're feasting without shame in your love feast. So they're partaking of the love of the body, and yet they're in opposition to the body. And what he begins to talk about is that they speak evil against what they know not, mm -hmm. and they despise authority. So this, this is a description of the modern day church, but the modern day church got a head start in Jude's day, and so he's addressing it. And, and he's saying that he begins to show us that, that the blackest darkness is reserved for these people who will not keep in the bounds of God's order who do not perceive authority and feel the fear of God toward it, but instead speak evil of what they know not, and they're like waves coughing up their shame and so on and so forth. He says the blackest darkness is reserved for them, just like the angels who did not keep their proper abode. Amen? So then he says that these angels are kept in chains of darkness because they did not keep their proper abode. And this would refer, it seems, to the fall of Satan, when Satan was not content to stay in his place as second in command, to stay in his place as, as of greater beauty and wisdom, but not, of, not taking the place of God. Instead, he sought to take the place of God. So he didn't keep his proper abode. He tried to usurp God's authority, God's place. And there's... So there's a consistent theme here in what Jude is saying. This is analogous to these people who despise authority in the church. They won't stay in their place. This is, of course, analogous to what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 12. Don't think more highly than you ought to think because you're not as gifted as you think you are. My paraphrase, but, you know, you have a portion, not the whole bunch. So that's what Jude is saying is and that's how the angels fell. That's how the devil fell. Amen. And then as, an, as a side note, he shows that Michael the archangel, he depicts this reverence for authority when he shows that Michael the archangel, when he contended with the body of Moses, contended with the devil over the body of Moses, he was unwilling, Michael was unwilling to be real blasphemous even towards Satan. And this is to indicate to us that Michael had a fear of God not to honor Satan in, in the sense of Satan's character or behavior, but to recognize he was a creature made by God and formerly was uh, uh, appointed by God to a great position. And so Michael exhibits the opposite of those who speak evil against what they do not know and revile mag uh, angelic majesties. Michael says, the Lord rebuke thee. That's what they mean to say there. The Lord rebuked thee. He would not bring railing accusations against the devil, but he says, the Lord rebuked thee. So in this scenario, Michael is, would have been under, he would have been a lower angel than Satan. And though Satan has fallen, Michael is unwilling to forget the place he was originally created in. And so he appeals and says, God is going to deal with you. The Lord is going to rebuke you. It's not my place to bring railing accusations against you. And this is metaphorically similar to, to David and Saul, mm -hmm. where Saul is rejected of God. Like Lucifer, he's fallen from his place. 
He's, he says, the kingdom has been taken from you and given to another. It's already been, David is the king designate. He, it's already been, the kingdom has already been promised to him. And yet David is unwilling to touch the Lord's anointed. For it says, do not touch my anointed and do my prophets no harm. David has this fear of God that, okay, Saul may be rejected. Saul may be a bad man. God may be taking the kingdom from him. But as far as I'm concerned, I need to preserve honor because he is a placeholder in a bigger order, an order that's been designed by God. And so David will not bring railing accusations against Saul. It's what Jesus is saying to the Pharise uh, about the Pharisees after he has excoriated them, after he has shamed them, rebuked them. His position in God's order allowed him to do that pretty freely. <laughs> but then he tells the people, you need to honor the Pharisees and, and obey them because they sit in the chair of Moses. And he says, do what, they say, do what they say and not as they do, for they sit in the chair of Moses. And what he's saying is, this, these people fill a place in your life that is, and all authority is given of God, as Paul says in Romans 13. So Paul says that we should honor Caesar, pay our taxes, be obedient to the state, for it is God's servant. Again, it's this reminder that Submission is not based on our, our perception of the worthiness of the one we're submitting to. Amen. Submission is based on a transcendent order and design that God has given. And we can be, we can be blasphemous, we can be out of line, even in, in rebuking the devil as if we had authority over him. Hmm. We have to appeal to the Lord. And, and, and Jude is making all of this as metaphorically parallel or analogous to those in the church who apparently felt the liberty to rebel against their elders, to blaspheme leaders, to speak evil of, of dignitaries, he says. So those who were, who were put in places of oversight or authority. He is against the unleashing of, of uh, the spirit of rebellion against constituted authority in the church which is a sign of the Antichrist, according to Paul. Amen? Amen. If, you, if you read Clement of Rome, I think it's his second epistle, you get an insight into where the church was going. And what Clement's entire epistle is a rebuke of the younger generation who has risen up in insolent rebellion against the first generation because they think they can point to flaws in the first generation's behavior. And, and he is appealing to them and saying, don't do this. That is what Jude is doing. The fact that he mentions the context for this dispute between Michael and, Sa and Satan is somewhat inconsequential. That is a, a mention in passing. His point is that My Michael did not bring railing accusations because Michael was aware of a bigger order that was inviolable, that he had to stay in his place if he was relating to the state if he was relating to, the, to a rejected king, if he was relating to Satan, or if he was relating to his elder in the church. Amen. I think even, I mean, you mentioned David and Saul, it's who I was thinking of too, but it just seems like it's even strengthened when both times that David just stepped a little bit out of line, you know, close to where um, he, he could have taken Saul's life or he cut his robe off. You just see his entire attitude was completely, I mean, vulnerable, self-sacrificial. There was just this sense that he was so struck mm -hmm. by even getting close to that, that it was like, uh, look what I've done. I, I cannot do this. Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know. It just thinks it, it strengthens what you're saying there. Amen. 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 We, um, <clears throat> we did get a thank you from that first question about unbelief. Um, thank you for the fullness of the answer to that question. Well, anybody else? Six six one two one two five four one five. I, th I think we can wrap it up there. Unless you wanted to add anything or say anything, you want to add anything to that authority question or no, sir. Okay. I don't That's think good. that. I don't think he's. His point is not that. It's not to draw our attention to the dispute over Moses's. Yeah. Body. Nothing in the context of the epistle makes any other reference to to that event. Whatever he's talking about, there must have been some knowledge of how that went. But right. I agree. I think his point was about authority. as right. an example. Okay, well, thank you for your questions. Those were substantive. Uh, please feel free to text them during the week or 
uh, next Saturday and we'll do our best to answer. God bless you. We'll see you next time or you'll see us next time. <laughs>